Hi everyone. I wonder how you'd complete this sentence. During lockdown, the thing I've missed above all else is... You can fill in your own answer. I don't suppose there is any shortage of candidates to fill that gap. There are lots of things that we miss. And I know that for some, Sundays have been particularly hard. There's a, a heightened consciousness of being apart from others when we'd rather be together. And so later on in our service, as we say the Lord's Prayer, a prayer that we're invited to say together, it won't be led by my voice, but by a whole range of voices from within our church family. And I hope praying in that way will remind us that as we say our father, rather than my father, your father, his father or her father, that as we call upon God, we are together as one, brought together in Christ by his grace and for his glory. But right now, things are not the way we'd want them to be. And actually, as we continue our journey through the story of Jacob and his dysfunctional family, they're in a place that is totally unenviable. Where can they turn to? And we find a similar starting point in Psalm 7. It's a prayer that looks to God to right things that are wrong, injustices that are presently there to straighten out things that are crooked. So let's worship God as we say the words of Psalm 7 together. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. O oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. You who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. God is my shield, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. If one does not repent, God will whet his sword. He has bent and strung his bow. He has prepared his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. See how they conceive evil and are pregnant with mischief and bring forth lies. They make a pit digging it out and fall into the hole that they have made. Their mischief returns upon their own heads and on their own heads their violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness and sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. O righteous God, remove from our lives all duplicity and deception. Help us to disentangle guilt from grief so that we might truly confess our sins and then walk in the paths of righteousness, peace and joy, following the way of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>
walk by faith and not by sight. By faith this mountain shall be moved, and the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible, for all who call upon his name. Living God, take our words, our praise, our thinking and all that we share together, however imperfect it may be, and use it for your glory. For you are our Father, whose arms are open to us, whose hand is always ready to take hold of ours, who, when our bodies are tired and our hearts are cold, when we're frustrated or exhausted, assures us, holds us, refreshes and treasures us. Meet with us now, Lord, just as we are, aware of all the things we've failed to do, things that we have done or said that would have been better left undone or unsaid. Some of these things we confess now and we ask you for forgiveness for them so that we can enjoy being in your presence, speaking with you, trusting you, following your lead and taking the next step in the light of the hope that you set before us. Father, you have given us so much. You have shown your love in giving Jesus Christ to be our Saviour and Lord. And through your Spirit, we are bound together in one family. No two faces or stories are the same. But we find ourselves surrounded by sisters and brothers. We thank you for the gift of your word. And as we read from it and consider what it has to say to us, we ask that you would be our teacher. Help us to love you better, to serve you more faithfully, and to be the sort of people who you desire and by your spirit enable us to be. And hear us now as we pray the familiar words that Jesus taught his friends to pray. Our Father, in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. And your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 Oh, sisters and brothers, be strong, do not lose heart. Though you weep and you suffer And the road you walk is hard Let the grace of another Become your path to peace May Jesus hold you through your grief Replace 
with the feast of the Lord. And our enemy death is consumed in the blaze of God's glory. And our grief will be no more. We are heavy with sorrow, but this burden will not last. There is joy yet to follow, there is glory unsurpassed. And our strength for tomorrow is a perfect hope of Christ. May Jesus lead you through your life. The weeping may come in the night, there'll be joy in the morning. When the taste of our tears is replaced with the feast of the Lord And our enemy death is consumed in the blaze of God's glory And our grief will be no more The weeping may come in the night, there'll be joy in When the taste of our tears is replaced with the feast of the Lord And our enemy death is consumed in the blaze of God's glory And our grief will be no Genesis chapter 37 verses 12 to 36 Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem and Israel said to Joseph As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem Come, I am going to send you to them Very well, he replied So he said to him Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take them back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So, when the Midianites' merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern 
and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, The boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it's your son's robe. He recognised it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Amen. As we listen to this story of a dysfunctional family unravelling before us, we sense the emotional register being cranked ever higher. Who has felt love or loss like Jacob? Who has ever felt hate-fired jealousy like those brothers. But I don't want us to dial it back down. I don't want us to domesticate the emotion in this story because the emotion is part of the message. And I want us to focus on Jacob rather than Joseph. Jacob who was flawed, uh, certainly unwise but who was without a doubt someone who passionately and deeply loved his son. I want to read to you uh, two excerpts, words that we've already heard from Genesis 37 that hone in on this aspect of Jacob uh, and his family. First of all, I want to read a passage from a novel, Gilead by Marilyn Robinson. This novel is written in the form of a a long letter written by an older man who is a father uh, who knows he's about to die, uh, writing to his young son. And I think in various ways it helpfully resonates with Jacob's experience and Jacob's story. This is a father writing to his son. I can tell you this that if I'd married some rosy dame and she'd given me 10 children and they had each given me 10 grandchildren, I'd leave them all. On Christmas Eve, on the coldest night of the world and walk a thousand miles just for the sight of your face, your mother's face. And if I never found you, my comfort would be in that hope, my lonely and singular hope which could not exist in the whole of creation, except in my heart and in the heart of my Lord. That's just a way of saying I could never thank God sufficiently for the splendour he has hidden from the world, your mother accepted, of course, and revealed to me in your sweetly ordinary face. Then from Genesis 37. Now Israel, that is Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved them more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognised it and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. 
Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn till I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. The storytelling in Genesis 37 is exquisite. Only as a cloud, Joseph wanders across the, the open spaces. The beloved son sent by his father to his own brothers, only to be utterly and violently rejected. His brothers were carefully tending their father's sheep, leading them to places of refreshment, protecting them from danger. They falsify evidence of an animal attack that never happened. Though, of course, in a sense, it did happen. The shepherds became predators. They saw and seized their vulnerable prey. And it was only Reuben's intervention that saved Joseph from a summary execution. He said he was cast into an empty cistern. Joseph, of course, the dreamer who had dreamt that they would bow down before him, that he would be honoured and lifted up, but instead finds himself cast down, looking up at them from the bottom of a pit. And then it was greed, not mercy, that spared Joseph that slow and lonely demise in a ready-made tomb. Joseph, it turns out, so precious in the eyes of his father, was worth just 20 shekels of silver to some passing merchants. And there was found a tidier solution, a happy transaction for all parties, no blood on their hands, a lesser offence, while still they imagined achieving the desired results. But it's as we dissect this story that we see that there is layer upon layer of deception, people deceiving others or deceiving themselves. Reuben, who cuts an interesting figure in this story, imagined that he could satisfy the hatred of 10 of his brothers whilst covertly saving the 11th. And perhaps we see in him some loyalty towards his father, if not to Joseph himself. But Reuben was deceived. He didn't have the full measure of the forces that were at work. His underlying good intentions, uh, well disguised as he helped throw Joseph into the cistern, uh, cannot excuse him. See, hatred uh, like that, that raw jealousy, can't be worked around or easily satisfied. Reuben temporarily uh, leaves the scene and in the absence of his influence and the unexpected arrival of some passing merchants seals Joseph's fate. When Reuben comes back, the cistern is empty, Joseph is gone, he's appalled. But the deal's been done. Joseph has gone, sold at the going rate to be sold again. And Reuben's good intentions are no good whatsoever now. He deceived himself. And of course, there's the most obvious deception in the story. Uh, as the, the brothers return to their father and they need only to present, show him this blood-soaked robe. A robe that no one would confuse and allow Jacob to draw his own conclusions. It's my son's robe. You know, some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Jacob, Jacob, who had sent Joseph on his way, no doubt watching with loving pride. Uh, there he goes, there's my Joseph, there's Rachel's boy, there he is wearing the robe I gave him. Joseph, who he trusted with the task, Joseph, who he cherished above all else, he'd sent him, sent him alone. And so he came to believe, sent him to his death. He'd never be home again. And as he examined the, the shapeless 
uh, mess of the blood-soaked coat, all that was most precious to him was now spoiled. And as the brothers watched their father tear his own robe in anguish, as he grieves, as he mourns, as it goes on day after day, as their father pushes them away, as they try in vain to comfort him, perhaps it dawned on them that they had deceived themselves. Jealousy and hatred can make a fool out of anyone, anyone. Uh, and the love that had been directed to Joseph was not going to be redirected to them. Like the coat, uh, now ruined, that had been given to Joseph. Jacob's love was no longer fit for anyone else. Their hatred had created a situation, a mess, uh, that could not easily be put back into the box. The coat that once uh, reminded them that tortured them as it pointed to Joseph's status as the, the favoured son it was now replaced by their father's tears as a reminder of where they stood. They've taken decisive action, but nothing is better. Everything is worse. Things fall apart. Psalm 7, and these are words we've already heard capture the, the futility of their situation. The psalmist says, see how they conceive evil and are pregnant with mischief. They bring forth lies. They make a pit, digging it out and fall into the hole that they have made. Their mischief returns upon their own heads and on their own heads, violence descends. So here's the mess and everyone in part is to blame. And I suspect that brother and father alike, deceivers and deceived, would ask themselves Reuben's question. Where can I turn now? Because who's not culpable? Who's not compromised? Where can they look? Could they look to God? Is God interested? Is God keeping score, recording every wrong turn? Where can they turn now? Snared by their deceit, Jacob languishing in despair. Seems everyone is cut off from one another and they all seem cut off from God. The promises made in the past and reaffirmed the promise of blessing seem to ring hollow part of a past that is cut off from the present that concerns a future that seems no longer possible and therefore totally unreal. Things fall apart and God knows what it will cost to put them back together. Let's step out of the story but not out of the Bible. Turn to Psalm 105. Psalm 105 uh, rehearses the, the story of God's people, both before uh, and after this dysfunctional generation that we've been thinking about through Abraham and Isaac, and then to Jacob and Joseph, and then to all those who would follow. And if the despairing question of Reuben is, where can I turn now? The Psalm invites us all to turn to God to turn to God and remember his track record, all his past promises and acts and judgments, and then to look to the Lord now and to look to the Lord always. It gives a, a detached perspective that raw emotion can crowd out and it reveals God at work long before anyone is willing to acknowledge it or to seek God out. The psalm says, look to the Lord in his strength, seek his face always. Remember the wonders he's done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. You, his servants, the descendants of Abraham, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. And then a little later on. And he, that is the Lord, and he sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave, 
They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons. Till what he foretold came to pass. Till the word of the Lord proved him true. See, this is so key. Amid all the deceptions of his people, the Lord still never departs from his promises. For Joseph, what he foretold came to pass till the word of the Lord proved him true. It's been said that that God uh, writes straight with crooked lines. The envy, jealousy and hatred of Joseph's brothers, the, the foolish love of Jacob led to complete disintegration. But still God will not let go of even the fragments and God will bind them together, even through the very one that they had rejected. It was God. God sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. You see, human deception will not, in the end, uh, drown out God's truth. The God who promises to bless Jacob's family and to bless the nations through him will not be thwarted or deterred or discouraged. God sees things fall apart and yet says, nevertheless, I will bring them together. It will take many years. It will involve suffering and tears, but they will be reconciled through the one that God has sent before them, the beloved son, first stripped of all privilege to be a lowly slave, going down into the depths before being raised up in honour and glory. And we'll see how all that plays out in the coming weeks. And amidst it all, we see the love of Jacob for Joseph, this beloved but forsaken son, And we see there an imperfect echo of a a wonderful reality. The awesome love of the God that we pray to, saying, Our Father, the Father of the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet whilst Jacob clung to Joseph, held him too tightly, even once Joseph seemed lost to him, who loved him with a jealous and unjust love, When we turn to God, we find a different measure of love that will give his one and only son, give him into the hands of his enemies, give him over even to death so that we might not perish, but know eternal life, that we might enjoy that life together within his family. So we find ourselves here on almost on holy ground. We're inching close to the heart of God. Father's will to be with his children, even if we appear a messed up family. A will to be with us through Jesus Christ, who is the first among many brothers and many sisters. It was in despair that Reuben asked, where can I turn now? And that's a question that we will all find ourselves asking. Where can we turn? And our hope, our Christian hope, is found as we turn to the beloved Son and see in him the love of God for us, a love for me and a love for you. With that in mind, I want to read from Romans chapter 8. This is a a longer passage and almost every uh, phrase or verse is worthy of a sermon of its own. And some of the words and ideas might not be instantly familiar or clear to you, uh, but I'm not going to stop to explain them. I want you simply to listen and to tune in and try and get a sense of the love of God the Father for you, made known in Christ. Things fall apart. They do. God knows that they do. 
But nonetheless, this is what we read in Romans 8 from verse 28 following. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God our Father, we see things in our world, in our own lives and even in our hearts that we do not like. We admit that we share that potential to deceive others and even to deceive ourselves. We know from experience that hindsight can be cruel and sometimes we're embarrassed by the things that we do and the things that we say. Yet as we turn to you, we discover that you don't lose your temper with us or write us off. Instead, in love and mercy, you have given us your beloved son to be with us and to die for us so that in him we might know and enjoy your love and that we might know and enjoy a place within your family. Help us to love you so deeply that we will trust you and to trust you so completely that we will follow you now and always. May our devotion to you shape every relationship we have from the intimacies of home and friendship to that difficult colleague, the awkward neighbour, the stranger we seem to constantly bump into, yet can so easily choose to ignore. Help us in these uncertain days to hold on to your promises. And in the light of those promises, help us to pray with perseverance, to pray for those with power and influence, for the government of Holyrood and at Westminster, and to pray for those who seem powerless, who are vulnerable, afraid, marginalised, and to pray for everyone in between. Now in this silence, we bring to you things that we've been carrying this past week, things that worry us, hurts, frustrations, sadnesses, and we place them into your hands. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you hear our prayers, that there is nowhere we can go for you are not there ahead of us, with us, and for us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Next Sunday is Pentecost, when we remember and celebrate the, the giving of the Holy Spirit. And we're invited, along with the whole Church of Scotland, to join together uh, virtually uh, in a shared service of worship. So that's going to be streamed next Sunday live at uh, 10 o'clock. And we'll feature contributions from all over the country. And I encourage you to take part in that uh, above and beyond anything that we might do ourselves as a local congregation. But for you, Sunday, next Sunday, may already feel like a long way away and there's plenty ahead for us. And our closing song, Be Thou My Vision, is a prayer of commitment that recognises that the Christian life is not an escape from the things that are difficult, but that it is something that we do with our eyes fixed on Jesus and equipped by him for all that lies ahead. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>